Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Sarah Sanbar and I'm one of the Ath Fellows here. Early on Monday, Iraqi, Kurdish and Allied forces began an operation to retake Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq, from ISIS. Within the first 72 hours of the operation, Iraqi and Kurdish troops had recaptured a number of villages. The operation to retake Mosul is just one example in the fight against ISIS. As we move farther and farther away from traditional conceptualizations of warfare, so too do our techniques of fighting. As leaders, policymakers, academics, and citizens discuss the best way to destroy ISIS, the necessity of the idiom, to defeat your enemy, you must first understand them, is apparent now more than ever. With us tonight is Rukmini Kalimaki, a foreign, respondent at, a foreign correspondent at the New York Times, whose reporting and fieldwork has contributed extensively to the West's understanding of ISIS's ideology, strategies, appeal, history, and influence. Earlier this spring, she wrote an extensive feature piece on ISIS's use of, use of birth control to maintain a steady supply of sex slaves. And last summer, she wrote of the lonely young American woman from rural Washington state lured by ISIS. She's a three-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, the winner of the Michael Kelly Award, and the first journalist in the 75-year history of the Overseas Press Circle to win both the Hal Boyle and the Bob Con Considine Awards in the same year. Her talk is co-sponsored by the Magrulian Center for Human Rights and the Keck Center for International Strategic Studies. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Rukmini Kalamaki. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that much too generous uh, introduction. Uh, the one thing that was left out of my biography is that I actually grew up in California in uh, the town of Ojai, uh, just two, two and a half hours away from here. So when you guys asked me to come, uh, I was so happy because I'm coming home. Um, and secondly, I have a, a small confession to make. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, I applied to Pomona and I didn't get in. <laughs> so I'm so grateful that you would have me now. <laughs> um, This is a photograph that was shot this week uh, by one of my colleagues in northern Iraq in the city of Mosul that Sarah just described to you. And this is where I'll be heading um, uh, in a couple of weeks after I finish this talk. You've heard of Mosul by now. Uh, it's the second largest city uh, in Iraq uh, with a population of at least one million people and that's under ISIS control. It was guarded by more than 30,000 uh, Iraqi troops. 30,000, try to get your head around that. And it took ISIS all of one week to overtake the city uh, in June of 2014. I wanted to take you back to this particular point, uh, which happened over two years ago, because it was the fall of Mosul which marked the moment when the world, in a way, woke up to the threat that this group posed. Up until then, ISIS was described uh, by US officials that I was interviewing, by European officials, and by the analysts who were, who were under their sway as just one of numerous armed groups in Syria. Certainly no more vicious and certainly no more dangerous uh, to the West than any others. But in fact, ISIS, on the day that it seized Mosul, um, in June of 2014, had been incubating in Syria since the summer of 2011. It was in 2011 that the group, which used to be known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and which was based in Iraq, uh, dispatched a small band of fighters um, to Syria with the goal of, of, of sowing the seeds of jihad and of their future state. So three years before Mosul fell in 2014, the group was growing and evolving, and yet the West, and really the world, failed to notice. The next thing they did after seizing Mosul is they drove um, to, sorry, that's Mosul up there. They drove to uh, the large berm, uh, which demarcates the border between Iraq and Syria. This is the berm. It's at the border of the two countries. Uh, and this area was under now, now under ISIS control after they had uh, seized Mosul. And with great fanfare, they proceeded to destroy it. This is a, 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 an image from uh, ISIS propaganda that was released uh, soon after. That berm uh, and, and, and the line that it demarcates um, is called the Sykes-Picot line. That's from the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was signed in the early 1900s by the colonial powers controlling the Middle East. And this line, 
that is drawn here on this antique map uh, was, was how the Middle East was carved up close to a century ago. It's, it's through this line that the modern uh, territorial boundaries of Iraq and Syria were created. And what ISIS did is they drove bulldozers to that berm and filmed themselves destroying it, essentially erasing the border between the two countries. Because their aim, as we now know, was to establish a global caliphate. It was going to be a territory starting here uh, in Iraq and Syria that would then stretch across the world where their very narrow and very brutal interpretation of Islam would be applied. Just after Mosul fell, experts estimated that the group went on to control in Syria and Iraq an area that spanned 35,000 square miles. That's the size of South Korea. They set to work establishing their caliphate and Western powers, especially the United States, I would say, which was already feeling the sting of a disappointing intervention in Libya, basically looked away. I remember attending briefing after briefing in Washington, uh, going to interview after interview uh, with US officials, members of the intelligence community, uh, members of the State Department, uh, and they kept on trying to convince me that this was a group that was focused on governing focused on holding and administering the territory that they, that they had, and again, applying their particularly narrow vision of Islam. Through this process, we also convinced ourselves that this group, unlike Al-Qaeda, was not interested in targeting the West. Yet all you had to do in mid-2014, so two years ago, to see that ISIS was hell-bent on attacking the West is read their propaganda which from its earliest days made clear that the West, especially France, but also the United States, Australia, and other countries uh, were considered targets. It wasn't until November of 2015, so last year, uh, when ISIS carried out the coordinated attacks in Paris that the world collectively had its next aha moment and finally acknowledged that yes, this was a group that was intending to target the West after all. I wanted to show you some of the many missed clues that, that we missed along the way. The first clue uh, that the Islamic State was, was really in the business of international terrorism came, in my opinion, on January 3rd, 2014. So remember, Mosul falls in June of 2014. So this is a full six months before the fall of Mosul. It was on that afternoon that police in the town of Oristiada uh, in Greece pulled over a taxi near this highway here. The town of Orestiada uh, is located just four miles from the Turkish border, and it was on its way to becoming a major crossing point uh, for people that were fleeing Syria and attempting to enter, uh, enter Europe. So on January 3rd of 2014, the Greeks pulled over a taxi, and in the car they found this man. His name is Ibrahim Boudina. I'm, I'm gonna call him clue number one, Ibrahim Boudina. <laughs> Boudina was then a 23-year-old French citizen. He had grown up in the resort city of Cannes. You know, you've heard of, of the Cannes Film Festival. He claimed to police that he was a tourist, but he was acting suspiciously enough that they pulled him aside and they decided to go through his bag. And in his bag, they found a USB stick. And on the USB stick, they found this. This is a bomb-making manual. It's written in French. I'm just going to take you through a couple of the pictures. It shows step by step how to, how to process the explosive. And it's not just any bomb manual, it's showing how to make a very particular explosive known as, as triacetone triperoxide, or TATP. This is the type of explosive that would later be used in the suicide belts of the Paris attackers on November 13th, uh, 2015, and in the suitcase bombs of the Brussels airport bombers who attacked the Brussels airport this March, uh, killing dozens of people. It was also this explosive, or rather the ingredients that are used to make it, that were found in several other foiled plots uh, in Europe. It's basically become ISIS's signature, signature explosive. And I wanted you to notice a couple of things. Look to the top right of this manual. What do you see up there? It's the ISIS flag, right? We're talking the very first few days of January 2014, so more than two years ago, right? The title of this bomb-making manual, I'm sorry, it's, it's small, it's in French, is Réalisation de bombes artisanales au nom de Allah. Literally, how to make artisanal bombs in the name of Allah, okay? Um, as an aside, I, w I wrote an article about uh, this bomb-making manual and the arrest of, Ibra of Ibrahim Boudina earlier this year. 
And I translated the name of the manual just like that. I'm a fluent French speaker, so I knew that it meant that. Um, and as soon as my piece went out, I got teased rather mercilessly on Twitter by, by readers who found the use of the word artisanal funny. So like artisanal bread and artisanal beer. <laughs> one, person, one person wrote to me that this, that this proves that, the ISIS, uh, that ISIS must have imported its bomb maker from Brooklyn. <laughs> so, anyway, back to Ibrahim Boudina. The police didn't have, the police in Greece didn't have an international arrest warrant uh, to stop Ibrahim Boudina, despite the fact that they found him with an ISIS bomb making uh, manual. And this points to the problem that Europe is still having, which is that Europe is made up of numerous countries and they don't share information. So anyway, um, even after finding the manual on him, they weren't able to detain him, they let him go, but they were concerned enough that they called their French counterparts and the French arrested him in February of 2014 in his family's apartment, which was located on the French Riviera. And in a utility closet on an upper floor of the building where his family lived, Police recovered three Red Bull soda cans filled with TATP. Okay, this is the image that I was able to get from the police file that was shared with me. So basically, he had three ready to use bombs in February of 2014. Um, he was booked on terror charges. I was able to get his entire court record and I went through it, it's, it's over 600 pages long. What's really curious about the way the officials treated this case is you can read in the court record that they describe him as an extremist, they describe him as a jihadist, they describe him as a militant, they point out his connections to other uh, extremists in, in, the, in the French Riviera area, uh, but they fail to identify him as an ISIS fighter, even though the court records show that he had joined ISIS. You have to dig through hundreds of pages of these records to finally understand that this guy was actually a member of ISIS. And in the press reporting that was done uh, in the wake of his arrest, he was described, again, as a militant, as a jihadist, but basically as acting alone outside of the organizational structure of a terror group. This was the first example of what would become a trend. Um, this, this word, if you want to piss me off, this is the word to use, <laughs> um, or the phrase to use. Uh, uh, basically, this is how attacks in the West that were carried out by, by ISIS um, members, even the ones that came from the core, this is how they've been described. I was able to identify around two dozen members of ISIS who trained in Syria and who returned to Europe during the early part of 2014 and, and throughout 2015 specifically to carry out attacks. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm relying, most of my sources are in French intelligence, so my documents are predominantly French, okay? Um, I also have some German uh, intelligence files, Austrian, and some, uh, and some from Belgium, but my count of two dozen fighters who returned is obviously incomplete because I don't have records for the other European countries. It's clear that the number is higher than that. Most of their plots failed, but even when they succeeded, officials rushed to label each one of these early attacks as the work of lone wolves, meaning that they were acting alone. And each time, the connection to the terror group was downplayed or even downright ignored. I wanted to give you a few more examples. Do you guys remember an attack on the Jewish Museum of Brussels? Yeah? In May of 2014, a man walked into this museum here, it's called the Jewish Museum of Brussels, and opened fire, killing four people. Three were, were shot at the scene and died there. A fourth person uh, was made it to the hospital but ended up dying later. That same day, Belgian officials uh, gave a press conference where they invited reporters like myself, and they said, quote, he was probably acting alone. And they said this in the first hours when they hadn't even identified who this guy was, right? His name was Mehdi Namush. That's the, I'm sorry, it's, it's grainy, but that, that's the only um, known photograph uh, of him. Um, and a few days after the attack in May on the, on the museum, he was caught. And in his luggage, uh, the police found um, an image of the ISIS flag, okay? This mugshot that you see here was, was broadcast on televisions and screens throughout Europe. And one of the people who instantly recognized him was this man, uh, the man who's, who's, um, who's uh, greeting the little girl. His name is, is Nicolas Enna. 
Uh, Nicolas is a French reporter, and he was one of 23 Western hostages who are kidnapped by ISIS in Syria and who are eventually held in the same facility as James Foley, the American reporter who ends up being, um, being cruelly uh, executed by the group. The Europeans, like him, all got out, um, uh, with the exception of the British, uh, and they got out because their governments paid a ransom, whereas the British and the American um, uh, State Departments uh, refused uh, to pay up. This is him, actually, uh, at the moment that he arrived in Paris greeting his family. Nicolas told me that, that he was actually in a hospital bed recovering um, from, from the trauma that he experienced in Syria. And the image of Mehdi Namouche, you know, uh, came up on his TV set. And he says he instantly recognized Mehdi Namouche. Why? Because he was one of his jailers uh, in Syria. And he wasn't just any jailer. He was one of the people that took him and others aside for torture. He was brutally beaten by that man. So, Again, the, the May 2014 attack is described as being carried out by a man who has no connection to, to any group, as probably acting alone. He wasn't just ISIS, he was a core member of, of this fraternity of fighters because it's only the most elite fighters who had access to the Western hostages. I have, a, I have so many more examples and I won't bore you with all of them, but let me just give you a few. In June of 2014, so now we're at the month when Mosul falls, a Belgian national um, is arrested in Brussels. It, he, was, he was days away from carrying out um, a martyrdom or a suicide operation. Again, he's described in these very vague terms. The, the link to ISIS is not, is, not, um, is not made explicit. And it's later in French intelligence documents that we see that on his phone, uh, they recovered over 200 messages, chats, etc., with a guy called Shakrib Akru, uh, that's a name that probably isn't familiar in America, but he was one of the suicide bombers who blew himself up in Paris. Again, a core member of ISIS. So again, somebody who is described as not having a connection, in fact, is in touch with, with the, most, um, the most inner members of this, of this terror organization. Also in June of 2014, a French national is arrested in Lebanon, in, in Beirut, the capital. He too was about to carry out a suicide operation. And interestingly, when that man is taken in for questioning, he admits in interrogation that he was deputed to do this terror attack by Abu Muhammad al-Adnani. Adnani was recently killed in a drone strike and was one of the most senior leaders of ISIS. The, the, the examples are too numerous uh, to cite. Um, but all of these attacks that I've mentioned, and many others, both the successful and the unsuccessful ones, were downplayed. The dots connecting them to ISIS were never connected. And the result of this is that when the November 13th attacks rocked Paris last year, people thought that ISIS had come out of nowhere. I was asked that question repeatedly on radio shows and TV programs that I did in the wake of, of this attack. The attack in Paris last November killed 130 people. It's the largest terror attack to have ever taken place in France, and France has its own problem with terrorism. And it was the largest terror attack in over a decade in Europe. Here's what the city looked like uh, on, on that dark day. I was in Iraq. Um, actually, I was, uh, I was just re returning from Syria on November 13th uh, of last year. And I got a call from my editor that evening um, asking me to rush to France. And I got there the next day. Uh, Paris is a, a city that I know well. I've, I've been going there with my family and, and as an adult since I was five. The normally 40-minute ride from the airport took me an hour and a half, maybe two hours. And all over the city, there were barricades, soldiers in camouflage, people that look like this. The city was transformed. The attack was like a slap in the face um, to the West. It was a wake-up call. But what happened in Paris, where an ISIS fighter, or actually a group of ISIS fighters, who had trained with the terror group in Syria, are sent back under the direct orders of the terror group, is actually just one of the ways in which ISIS is now mounting attacks. Uh, analysts will disagree with me. There's, there's different ways to, to break this up. But to, to simplify things, I have broken up their styles of attack into three categories. Number one is the directed attack, which is what November 13th was. Um, these number two and number three, in my opinion, are even less understood uh, than, than this um, frontal style of attack. The second style of attack is the true lone wolf attack, okay? Um, and, and that 
style of attack is a result of the fact that they have been able to flood the internet with their propaganda, with how-to guides uh, that show um, wannabe attackers everything from how to use encryption to how to make their own bombs. The purpose of this propaganda is to incite people who have a sympathy with their cause, but who are not able to travel to Syria, uh, and to, to egg them to action. This is, in fact, something that isn't new. This is a strategy that Al-Qaeda began years ago, starting around 2010, when they launched their magazine Inspire, which is pictured here. This is their English language magazine. It was pulled out, put out by Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula with the first issue coming out in 2010. And the point of Inspire was just that, to inspire those who wanted to carry out attacks in their name. Al-Qaeda argued in an internal document that I was able to obtain that, it, that their organization was falling into oblivion because it was taking too long to mount their signature attacks, like September 11th, like the East, embassy, the, the East Africa embassy bombings. Those are attacks that took months to years to mount. And in the interim, the public wasn't hearing from Al-Qaeda, and this operative argued that they needed to come up with a strategy to essentially have smaller attacks in the interim as they're waiting for the big ones to come, to come along. So they did exactly what ISIS is doing now. Uh, they put out propaganda that taught people how, um, to, how, how to carry out attacks on their own. And the most notable example, I, I, I feel, uh, of, uh, of fighters that they were able to, um, uh, to incite uh, without ever having contact with them was the Boston Marathon bombings in 2013. That was carried out by two brothers, the Tsarnaev brothers, who as far as we know, never trained in an Al-Qaeda uh, training camp, uh, never met any members of Al-Qaeda, and as far as we know, were not in contact with members of the terror group. But they used the recipes um, in, in the Inspire magazine, in Al-Qaeda's magazine, to prepare their pressure cooker bomb. Here's the article that they most likely read. The headline is, make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom <laughs> by the AQ chef. Okay. You have to admit at some level that they do have a sense of humor. Um, so on the second page is instructions on how to carry it out. Uh, and this is what the Boston Marathon attackers um, used to do this. This is a scene from the Boston Marathon. ISIS is doing the same thing, which is using propaganda to incite attacks. But unlike Al-Qaeda, they've had more success. Their attacks are, 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 are more numerous. They're coming uh, more quickly. Uh, and to date, the group has succeeded in inciting people who, as far as we know, have not had any contact with them um, uh, to carry out stabbings, to ram people with their cars, to carry out shootings in the United States, in Canada, in France, in Belgium, in Denmark, in Australia, and in other locations uh, as well. After almost every one of these attacks, I end up getting in Twitter, let's call them debates, uh, <laughs> with people who want to point out that the attacker was mentally unwell or that he was nursing some other dispute, Omar Mateen, homophobia, etc., and that therefore that doesn't constitute an ISIS attack. In my opinion, what they're missing is that this is part of ISIS's strategy, just as it, just as it was part of Al-Qaeda's strategy. ISIS doesn't care if the person who's carried out the act of violence was hearing voices, was schizophrenic, had just broken up with their girlfriend, all they care is that that person carried out an act of violence against the kufar, the infidel, which is basically all of us. It spreads terror, and that is the agenda of this terror group. So again, of the three classes of attack, we have number one, the directed attack, number two, the lone wolf attack, the true lone wolf attack. But to me, the most interesting category and the one that I think is the least understood and the one that I think we're going to start seeing the most of is a category that I'm going to call the remote controlled attack. Last April, in a suburb of Paris, a 24-year-old computer student called 911 saying that he'd been shot in the leg. The ambulance arrived, he was taken to the hospital, the paramedics began treating him, and pretty soon, uh, the paramedics and the hospital officials became suspicious of him because he started to give contradictory information of how he was shot. He initially said that he was walking along the River Seine, you've heard of the Seine, right? And that he came across a bag and he was curious and opened it and that in the bag he found an automatic weapon and he picked it up and it accidentally went off and he shot his foot and then he got scared because his fingerprints were on the weapon and so he dumped the bag in the Seine. That was the story that he tried to tell. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> anyway, police went back to the place where he had called paramedics, and they actually found a trail of blood on the ground that led to this man's car, okay? His name is Sid Ahmed Glam. In his car and in his apartment, the police found an arsenal of weapons, bulletproof vests, uh, Glock pistols, uh, automatic weapons ammunition, uh, and interestingly, they also found a USB stick as well as other electronics uh, that made very clear that he was planning to attack a church in France. In the initial reporting on this event, media outlets quoted officials saying that he was planning a possible imminent terror attack and that he was possibly in contact with an overseas terrorist. But again, there's no mention of the Islamic State. Last month, I was in Paris, and I was able to get the full investigation file on Sid Ahmed Glam from the, the DGSI, which is the France's domestic intelligence agency. And it paints a very different story. On the USB stick that was found in his car, investigators found that he was in direct contact with this man. His name is Fabien Clan. This man is considered one of the most senior French commanders uh, in ISIS. Uh, when the November 13th attacks happened in Paris, a couple, of, a couple of days later, ISIS released an audio tape where they claimed credit for the attack, and it was his voice that was on that audio tape. In addition to Fabien Clan, Sid Ahmed Glam was in touch with a second person. That person is this man. This is Ab Abdel Hamid Abawood. Um, his name is still not as well known as it should be in America, but he was essentially the most hunted man in Europe uh, for much of 2015. He was the on-the-ground planner uh, for the November 13th Paris attacks, and he died in Paris, uh, in the suburb of Saint-Denis, in a standoff with police. So in fact, it would be hard to have a more direct link to ISIS than that young man had. Let's look at his chats. Um, in the messages and chats, uh, investigators found that Sid Ahmed Glam was talking to, to Fabien Clan and to this, to this other ISIS operative, and they were going into the details of the operation he was going to carry out. He was going to carry it out on a church, and he wanted their advice on should he choose this church or that church, be church because this church is closer to his house, but it's also close to a police station. So really, the nitty-gritty details of what his target is and how he's going to carry out um, this, this act of murder. But even more surprising uh, is how the two operators inside the Islamic State, so, so Abdel Hamid Abaoud and Fabien Klan, how they are able to reach back into Europe, into France, and arrange the logistics uh, for the future attacker. So you see in France, unlike here, uh, it's not that easy to buy a gun. <laughs> um, this is one of the documents that I got from French intelligence. It's, it's from the criminal brigade uh, in Paris, which, which led the first investigation into the attack. And this is a document that outlines what they found um, in his getaway car. Uh, and, and in the getaway car is where they found the USB stick. This is the second page. The second page is a transcript of one of the chats that is on um, the USB stick. I'm going to translate it for you because it's in French. It's a communication between ISIS speaking to the future attacker in Paris, and, and he's talking about the fact that he needs to get weapons. And the guy in Syria, the handler, says to him, you need to drive to this particular sandwich shop. He names the sandwich shop. Uh, once you get to the sandwich shop, you need to cross the street. And across the street, you're going to find a complex. And in the complex, you're going to find a garage. In the garage, go and look for the Renault Megane, the car. And he says, look either for the newest model or the one just before it. He then tells him, once you find the Renault Megane, I need you to look on the right front tire, and there you're going to find the keys. Once you find the keys, open the car, and in the back seat, you're going to find a, um, you're going to find a bag, and in the bag were the weapons. Do you see what I mean about remote controlled attack? This is, these are people sitting in Syria who are essentially arranging a weapons drop for somebody in Paris, okay? This is how far they are reaching back in. And I'm actually, this is a story I'm working on right now. I'm working on a similar case uh, in Asia. I'm not gonna name the country in case there's reporters here. Um, but in that, <laughs> in, in that particular case, uh, a very well-known um, ISIS operative arranged for these people in India to pick up weapons, to pick up ingredients for their explosives, uh, to pick up ammonium nitrate, and sent them all basically on a treasure hunt all over India to different cities, giving them GPS coordinates where they could pick up these different things, right? So it's, it's just the opposite of 
essentially what we've been told, um, that this group has only a tenuous connection to these attackers on the ground. Um, what I'm seeing is that more and more attacks are fitting in this last category, the remote controlled attack. And I'm, I, I wanted to close by giving you some examples from this very bloody summer that we just had. You might have heard um, that this summer in July, a teenager in Germany boarded a train with an ax and proceeded to attack passengers on this train. That's him here. The reason I have this photo of him is because before carrying out this attack, this young man recorded a video pledging his allegiance to the leader of ISIS. And this video, within a day of the attack, was uploaded on an ISIS Telegram channel to which I subscribe, okay? Um, here was the opening screen. Germany video of the Islamic State soldier, Mohammed Riyadh, who carried out the Würzburg attack. Notice how they call him an Islamic State soldier. Despite this video, German officials initially said that they weren't sure if there was a connection to ISIS. And it was days and weeks later that we learned that the teenager was in direct contact with someone who was guiding him. A again, a handler inside the Islamic State. And that handler was messaging him literally moments before he boarded the train. Less than a week after the Würzburg attack, again in July of this year, a man carrying a bomb in a backpack headed to this cafe in the town of Ansbach, also in Germany. He sat down and detonated uh, the bomb in his backpack, which blew up and killed him. Luckily, did not kill anybody else, but injured people at that scene. And again, less than a day later, uh, a video of him pledging allegiance to ISIS appears on an ISIS uh, channel on, on the app Telegram. Again, he's described as a soldier of the Islamic State. Um, and he too was described as acting alone, despite the link to ISIS that is evident from the video. Again, days and weeks later, we learned that he too was in touch with a handler who was also coaching him in the days before the attack and who showed him how to make the bomb. Just two days, so now we have July 18th, July 26th, I think, uh, and just two days after this, in Normandy, in France, um, sorry, that's the, attack in, the attacker in Germany, just two days after the, the Ansbach attack, uh, two attackers in Normandy, France, forced their way into this beautiful church. Um, they forced the, the congregation's elderly priest to kneel near, near the altar, and they used a knife to kill him. It took less than five hours for ISIS to release its video, showing the two attackers pledging allegiance. Again, this is the opening screen. This is them. What's interesting about this shot, I haven't, I haven't yet confirmed this, but um, uh, there are people who, who are saying that they actually recorded this video in the entranceway to the church. So this, you see on the, on the top there, that it's, it's uh, the stairs that are believed to go to the upper level of the church. So they're actually sitting in the place that they're going to attack. The ISIS flag is on the back of a picture frame. I mean, how brazen, you know, is that? This time, officials were more blunt, and the French government made clear within days that the attackers had been teleguidés. Teleguidé is French for remote controlled. Um, they, they said that he'd been in touch with an ISIS handler and they named that handler, his name is Rashid uh, Kasim. He has a well-known um, telegram channel that French uh, fighters uh, all, or French, uh, French wannabe fighters are all members of. And in addition to this attack, this devastating attack on, on an elderly man um, in, in, a, in a church, that same handler was, was linked to numerous other attacks in France, including most recently, I don't know if you heard, there were three young women who parked a car in front of Notre Dame that was filled with gas canisters it, with, with a plot of trying to blow up the car in a very touristy uh, part of, of Paris in front of Notre Dame Cathedral. In addition to the examples that I've cited for you, so these are three, I have been able to confirm that there have been remotely guided attacks in India, in Bangladesh, in Malaysia, in Jakarta, in Australia, in the United States, and in Canada. Um, and these are, this is just from my, own, from my own research. Now, as I went down, um, you guys are really quiet, so I just wanted to be clear that I hope that nothing I said today is meant to scare you. 
that's really not the point here. Uh, terrorist attacks are a low frequency event. You're much more likely to be killed in a, in a car crash anywhere in Europe and in America. I think you're more likely to be killed by a toddler carrying a gun, which I think has become a category of crime. Um, but the point I do want to make is that the problem of ISIS is a problem that was exacerbated by officials first ignoring the problem altogether and then second by downplaying each successive attack and by incorrectly labeling them as isolated lone wolf attacks that were unconnected to the core. In closing, I just wanted to leave you with this image. This, of course, is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And this is what Paris looked like a couple of weeks ago when I was last there. There are now soldiers wearing fatigues, patrolling the streets of one of the world's most famous capitals. Thank you so much. We will now have time for questions. Please raise your hand and Michael or I will come to you with the microphone. Hi, thank you for Hi, your talk. Evening. Thank you. Uh, so do you think that there's a motivation to, for why you would not categorize these attacks as ISIS related? Like is there a motivation to uh, publicize it as a lone wolf attack or is it just sort of misguided? I think in the last year, in the last year we've been in a very strange period of time in America where we're in the midst of a, of a very contentious um, uh, election season. President Obama came to office years ago promising to get us out of two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, and he did, right? But that, that has become one of his legacies, as has the, Syria, the, the carnage that is happening in Syria now which has become at the same time one of the biggest blemishes you know, on his record. So it seems to me that, that there's a political motivation for, for playing it down because if it's played up, the, the, the question that everybody will want to ask is how did, this, how did this occur? Why was this allowed to occur on your watch? In France, it's a little bit more complicated. In France, they've had misadventures in, um, in the country of the Central African Republic, where troops are, are still stationed there. At the same time, they had a very successful intervention in Mali to push back Al-Qaeda. Um, so there, the dynamic is a little bit more different. Hi, thank you Hi. for your talk. Thank you. Um, what do you think is the role that the United States plays as far as uh, sharing intelligence with the European partners? Because it seems like the United States' priority would be preventing these attacks from happening in the United States, but they must be monitoring similar channels than the ones that the European countries are, are monitoring. I think the US is, is sort of first in line right now to be getting um, some of the best intel. They recovered terabytes of data in the town of Manbij in Syria, which was one of the towns that was just taken back, including documents that showed um, how the fighters were processed through a dormitory when they first arrived there. And it, 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 it's my opinion that, that, that the Americans know a lot. Um, to what extent they're sharing it, I don't know. One of my best sources in Paris actually asked me, can you please go to, go to American intelligence officials and identify Abu Suleiman al faranzi Abu Suleiman al faranzi is this senior leader uh, that we believe um, is involved in, uh, in plotting external attacks. And he told me the French don't know, the Americans know. So um, to what extent they're sharing it, I don't really know. Hi, thank you for your talk. Hi. And I'd like to ask, looking at the tragedy of the genocide of the Yazadi people, is there anything the West or the world can do as a whole to prevent another genocide in the region? What happened to the Yazidi people is really a blemish on all of humanity, I think. Um, I spent months and months uh, last year uh, taking testimonies from Yazidi women. Um, they were systematically raped and they were, they were identified for slavery by ISIS because of the unique religion uh, that they practice. And the stories that have come out of there are, are just, they're, they're almost too hard to, they're almost too much to even report. You know, they're, they're so awful. The Yazidi people always ask me, why is it that when 200 Chibuk girls from the village of Chibuk in Nigeria were taken captive by Boko Haram, why is it that there was a hashtag that went around the world, Michelle Obama posed in the White House with bring back our girls, the hashtag, 
and America sent military planners to Nigeria to try to bring uh, the victims home. Nothing of the sort uh, was done for the Yazidis, and I, I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's of course part of the conflagration that is Syria. Um, it's very difficult to get these people out, but the world's um, inaction in the face of the unbelievable um, suffering uh, of those people is, is to me, shocking. So one thing I found interesting is you were talking about the lone wolf phenomena, and I noticed that that's a reoccurring pattern. It's been happening in the United States with a lot of mass shooters. Yes. And I was wondering if you had any opinion on why that's a reoccurring phenomena and why that happens, like no matter what their affiliation might be. I, I, I don't think I'm qualified to talk about other mass shootings um, because I'm looking just at ISIS. And I, and I do think the ISIS phenomenon and the Al Qaeda phenomenon is its own thing. I don't think that a school shooting impacts what happened in San Bernardino, right? Uh, but as far as uh, the ISIS um, attacks in America, there have been about half a dozen, um, much less than, than Europe, but we've definitely had our fair share. Uh, given the fact that uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda have evolved pretty rapidly, where do you see that going, uh, seeing that you're very involved and have a lot of foresight into the politics and evolution? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the... the so uh, where, where saying, do we see ISIS and Al-Qaeda going? Yeah, like from a strategic standpoint. So I think the most worrying thing that we're seeing is that both Al-Qaeda and ISIS have created this portable ideology this ideology that you can become a member of without ever connecting to the terror group, right? Um, and we're seeing that young people all over the world have gone and imbibed their, their, their awful videos, um, their lectures, et cetera, and have used that to jump off to, to acts of violence. And I guess, the main, I guess the main trajectory I'm seeing is that they're becoming more and more sophisticated at using nothing more than the internet to reach their target audience. And I don't, I don't really see how we in the West can counter that without truly infringing on the free speech you know, conventions that make our society what it is. Hi, hi. Um, so on that point about the, um, this ideology that they are spreading, um, I'm interested in maybe the psychology behind ISIS and how um, people can be persuaded by a social convention and by ideologies, but then when, when they really become hard set in these ideas is when they become moral values and when they're attached to their morals. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to reason with somebody who believes that what they're doing is right or what they're doing is moral. Um, and so I'm not sure what attempts uh, could be taken to reason with um, people who are committing these acts or with anyone in ISIS. Uh, and so from a psychology perspective, do, do you think these have become moral values? And is there a possibility that we can reason with them? I think the most um, interesting tool in countering uh, their ideology is people who joined uh, these groups uh, and managed to pull themselves out. These are the most credible messengers uh, against this ideology. I just uh, got back from Washington um, a couple of months ago and I interviewed uh, Jesse Morton, who's an American citizen, and uh, during um, the period when he was active, he, w he became one of the most prolific recruiters for Al-Qaeda uh, in America. Um, so many plots uh, between, I think, 2008 and 2011 were directly linked to the website where he was, where he was putting out propaganda and, um, and inciting people to violence. And Jesse ends up getting arrested. He was arrested in Morocco and extradited back to the U.S. He was put in solitary confinement. And he talks about how up until that point, uh, his, basically his passage through Islam had been through the coaching of radical imams that he, who, under whose sway he fell. And in solitary confinement, he started to read the Quran again by himself. And he started to realize that there were things that didn't add up. Um, there were things that he was told that in fact aren't reflected in the scripture. He started to see holes in it. And his story to me is, is it's really moving uh, because 
he has this, this complete transformation, if, if he's to be believed, and, and I think the FBI believes him because he was released after just three years. Um, and he has now been hired at George Washington University at their program on extremism. And he's basically the first of his kind in America. He's going to be researching and talking about the very ideology um, that, he was, that he was spewing. Um, of course, it's, it's a, really, um, it's a really, really delicate balance that his employer is walking. Uh, they got an enormous amount of hate mail from, um, from families, <laughs> from parents who said, how, how dare you, you know, bring basically a, you know, uh, an Al-Qaeda um, member to, to campus. Uh, but I think that, that what he can do um, is really important. And it's, it's strange to me that, that he's really the only one in America. In England, they have several people of this nature at the Quilliam Foundation. In, England, in, in Canada, they have a guy called Mubin Sheikh, who at one point was, was flirting with the Taliban. And I've seen these people actually online. Um, Mubin Sheikh was in touch with this woman from Washington State that I ended up doing a big profile on. Uh, this young woman from Washington State had fallen under the sway of ISIS. But she was having doubts because she wasn't sure about these beheading videos. They seemed kind of cruel to her. And I saw Mubin on her public timeline going at it with her, you know, and saying, she, she was basically putting out, you know, the ISIS line, whatever it was. And Mubin was saying to her, I've been there. I've believed that. And believe me, that's wrong, right? And then, and, and, but he's able to do it from a real position of authority because he walked in those shoes, right? Um, I, I don't believe that a government-backed, I, I don't know, but it seems to me that a government-backed program is going to instantly be discredited you know, by these people because it's the Kufar government, it's the infidel government. So I wonder if that's the way forward. Um, it's, it remains very controversial, um, and Jesse's hiring was a private endeavor. It wasn't something that was in any way backed by, um, by the State Department, et cetera. Thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, I had a question about uh, the attack or the fight back in Iraq and Syria. Sure. Um, the propaganda is out there on the web already. There's clearly been a spread of the ideology. It exists. Um, how effective would you know fighting, making breakthroughs in Iraq and Syria and pushing back ISIS? How effective would that be in stopping? Do you think? international terrorist attacks and also how how can you kind of safeguard yourself against the people who already hold these ideologies setting up another similar group and you know in the future so I guess my answer is two parts um, on the one hand the caliphate has been an enormous recruiting selling point uh, for for Isis it's how they were able to, in part, how they were able to get recruits away from Al-Qaeda because they were able to say, look, it, it's already happening. It's not something that's going to happen in the future, which is what Al-Qaeda keeps on saying. It's here now in Raqqa. We're living life the way the Prophet Muhammad lived uh, at the time of the early Muslims, right? So erasing the, ca the caliphate, removing the territory that they control is, I think, essential in this fight. But so much has been made of pushing back uh, ISIS from Iraq and Syria that I'm afraid that people think that once we take Raqqa, <laughs> once we take Mosul and Raqqa, that the problem's gonna go away. Once we take those two cities, we're basically just going back to 2014, right? Before they had them. The, the threat was there before. Before they held any territory at all, th that ideology was there incubating, growing, you know, et cetera. Um, and so I think uh, we need to find a way to deal with the ideology itself and um, and I don't know that we know how to do that yet. Hi, thank you for talking. Sure. Um, so I had a question. So over the past two years, well, I'm from France originally, but my family is also from Cameroon. So I was in France two years ago, and what we saw was that there was terrorist, there was terrorist activities, of course, but at the same time, the government institutions had more kind of resilience or resistance to that um, terrorist activity. But I was in Cameroon last summer, and actually, they weren't letting expats in, but somehow we got in. And while I was there, actually, a 12-year-old girl like suicide bombed herself across the street from us, which caused us to leave. And what we saw was that people constantly lived in fear because the government, even the Cameroon army itself, couldn't combat against Boko. This was Boko Haram, by the way, so it wasn't ISIS. Okay. But we see that 
even the people and the government itself lives in fear of these terrorist activities, where you see, I know you did research on both West Africa and yeah. Europe, but Europe seems to have more resistance just due to their, like their Western establishment, their development as a country. Yeah. But how would you go about, I say, just the first couple steps to combating terrorism in those countries like West Africa, like Cameroon, for example, where their development isn't? My God, I mean, I, I think the, the Boko Haram problem is, is so immense, I don't, I don't even know where to start. But like all of these groups, like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, like ISIS, um, Boko Haram controls territory. So step number one is to remove that territory, right? And then step number two is to address the root causes of the radicalization, right? Um, the latter is, I think, much more difficult. Uh, the first part should, should have been somewhat straightforward with the Chadians, um, with the Chadians playing a leading uh, role. And so I'm, I'm a little baffled that, that Boko still seems to be in the Sambisa forest, um, still holds the girls, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, Thank you. Politicians and leaders like have been recommending to call ISIS Daesh in order to deny them the power that they seek. Mm -hmm. um, and I could see that denying the connection between the attacks that you described and, and ISIS would maybe kind of have that similar vein of denying them legitimacy. Right. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are um, on the consequences of continuing to downplay um, those connections. <laughs> Of course, you know, I cover ISIS full time for the New York Times, so of course I, I have sort of a bias, you know, in this regard. It's my opinion that the lack of coverage in 2011, 2012, 2013, and early 2014 is partly to blame, you know, for, for what's happened. When I'm doing a story, my audience is you guys. It's the American people, right? Anybody who speaks English. My audience is not ISIS. And I am trying to inform you guys about this terror group, and I feel that the American people people remain incredibly ignorant of what this group is because of this kind of misinformation that, that's been out there. Now, on the issue of whether you're giving them credence, it's an ongoing debate, um, but one thing to understand is that ISIS now has a rather sophisticated media of its own. Every, every fighter has Telegram in their Samsung or their iPhone. Telegram is an app. Right on this app, they're constantly. They have a, a news wire where they put out daily. You know, today it was it was they killed three Peshmerga in a suicide bomb. They put out videos of their beheadings and they put out lectures by their leaders, images, etc. So they have a very developed media of their own. Right, us not reporting it is not going to impact that. Right, that media remains active and will continue to put out ISIS propaganda. So now, in our own reporting, do we run the risk? by reporting this of essentially encouraging um, other people. I know of at least one case, this young woman in Washington State that I went to interview, she was actually a, a Christian, she was a Sunday school teacher. And her entry into ISIS was the day that James Foley was beheaded. She was watching CNN, she saw that awful image of him kneeling on the ground, she saw the, the ticker going across saying American journalist uh, beheaded in Syria, and she just went, oh my God, a beheading, you know, that's so awful, what is this? And she went on Twitter and did hashtag ISIS. <laughs> and within a day, she was in touch with them. <laughs> so I can point to that example as, as a direct corollary. You know, she found out about it through the Western media. But then she went on Twitter and immediately was in, in their media, right? Um, but again, I'm, I'm in the camp that we need to report on this group truthfully because I feel that people remain ignorant of it. And if they're ignorant, they're making inaccurate decisions um, uh, in, in policy, in, in how to co combat it, et cetera. Thank you for speaking. Um, I'm interested to know your thoughts on um, counter messaging strategies and campaigns that various agencies of government have put forth trying to interact with um, ISIS fighters on social media, um, have these efforts been effective? And if they've been ineffective, as I imagine you, you may believe that they are, how might, how might they be improved? They're ineffective because the messenger um, is tarnished from the get-go, right? If it's coming from a government mouthpiece, whether it's a State Department Twitter account or, or something else that is, that is tied to, to the American apparatus, it is immediately uh, this, uh, discredited by the terror group who says, you know, this is the Kufar media, this is the infidel media, right? 
Again, coming back to the, the question of the other um, young woman here, I think that the most credible messengers are people who were part of this terror group and managed to pull themselves out. Um, I was in Germany uh, in the month of August uh, to interview a guy called Harry Sarfo. Harry was uh, not just any member of ISIS, he was actually a member of what they call their special forces. So this is this elite um, uh, fighting uh, unit. He went through months of grueling training. And he tells the story, uh, there, there were a couple of, there were a number of things that made him leave the group. But there were two key moments that he talks about um, that, that really caused him to, uh, to lose faith. One of them was he, he himself had been a consumer of these videos that ISIS puts out. And he had na naively thought that those videos that ISIS puts out are actually what the caliphate looks like. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard. It, when I was interviewing him, it's, it's actually even hard to make sense of that because as a person that's in media, I know that those things are staged. You know, they look staged. They look, they, they look way too professionally done. But from his naive outlook, that's what the caliphate looked like. And he realized that they were fake on the day that he himself was invited to take part in basically a snuff video uh, for ISIS. It was a video for German-speaking members, and he and other German recruits uh, that were in Raqqa at the time were taken to Palmyra. They brought out prisoners, and then they were made uh, to execute them as, as the cameras rolled. And he talks about how he was surprised that when they, when they drove into Palmyra, the cameraman was waiting for them and told them to drive in again and again <laughs> because he hadn't gotten, the, the clouds of, of dust were obscuring his shot and he wanted to get a better shot, right? And that was surprising to him. So he, he suddenly went, oh, the stuff, that I was, the stuff that I was ingesting, you know, the stuff that I believed in, it's actually all made up, right? And I think putting, amplifying that voice, right, is, is something that might work. Um, interestingly, ISIS, after I did my interview with him, ISIS has put out uh, a poster that they've put on their Telegram channels identifying him as a priority target to kill, right? Um, they've tried to discredit him. They've, uh, they've, they've gone to other uh, media outlets uh, leaking images, etc., cetera, that, that attempt to show him in a bad light. And I think all of that is orchestrated because they know that his message is a credible one, right? Um, in, um, so I think that's the way forward, and, and unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a way forward that is very fraught because you can, imagine, you can imagine that if an American member of ISIS comes back to the U.S., people are going to want to string him up, right? It's going to be quite a leap of faith to let that person essentially resume a normal life in, in return for becoming a messenger against the group. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, I was born and raised in France, <clears throat> and um, sort of these issues really touched me personally. Yeah. The attacks were, were placed in a place where I grew up and where I'm friends sorry. go. I'm yeah. sorry. And um, I have a question for you. Uh, you talked at the beginning of understanding your enemy. And I think that reporters, in, at least in France, have been doing a better job of putting those attacks Absolutely. and understanding who these attackers are and right. their motivations. And I just have a question for you more around what is the next step that both the French government, the French society, and the French media can do to continue combating those attacks and making more of an impact and making sure that we don't live in a state of fear. You know, yeah. France has been in a state of uh, yeah. you know, terror attacks for two years now. And so the, how do we get out of that and what right. are the next steps that we can do? Right. First, I, ha I have to say that from, from where I sit, I think that France is doing um, as good of a job as it can. I'm really impressed with the fact that French officials um, starting I think November of last year, basically cut, cut out the BS, and now they're really leveling with the French people. After every single attack, you know that Prosecutor Mullins gets up and has a lengthy uh, press conference where he really, like, I, I, have, I have since, on the back of these press conferences, gotten the investigation documents that he's referring to, and I see in reviewing them that he's actually revealing a lot, you know, to the public. He's revealing who the attackers are, the method that they got their weapons, how they got into the country, things that are actually quite embarrassing, you know, if you think about it from the French state's uh, perspective. So my critique is more over here. Uh, to this day, um, the, the FBI has not released who the San Bernardino attackers were talking to. They've told us it's an overseas terrorist, but they've not identified him. Why, right? The 911 transcript from the Omar Mateen attack in Florida was initially redacted to remove every mention of ISIS. 
there was there was a there was a scandal. You know, the media revolted, politicians revolted, asking for the undoctored transcript. And um, so, to me, France seems like a model. Um, the, the, they have a really um, a really big job ahead of them because France was identified first and foremost by Adnani in his in his kind of inaugural speech as one of their main enemies. And because French foreign fighters are such a bulk, you know, of the foreign fighters that are in Syria, and their um, their hatred, you know, of the French state is visceral, right? Thanks. <clears throat> you started your talk with Mosul. Yes. Um, and and you noted how easily uh, a sort of you know ragtag band of of terrorists was able to take essentially Iraq's second or third largest city depending on how you count. And then you went on to talk about ISIS sort of uh, um, uh, tactics and about how it was incubating in the desert and we weren't paying attention. But of course, the reason that ISIS was able to take Mosul has little to do, or, or has maybe something to do with their, with, their, with their tactics and their network and the fact that they were incubating in Iraq and Syria during this time, but has a lot to do also with Mosul's particular history. And so, the, so one you know, conventional narrative is that that had to do with Sunni marginalization and, and you know, Maliki's sectarianism and so on. But added to that, there's a deeper history that maybe you saw the piece in the American Interest recently by an Iraqi woman called The Once and Future Mosul, where she talks about the longer history of Mosul, the 58 Rebellion and so on, right? Where Muslims have this, these grievances against Baghdad. So I'm just saying these things because when you say if our goal is to understand ISIL and how it's able to spread, and we can look at the tactics and all of this, but there's deeper reasons you have to look at, especially if we're talking about you know, scenarios for cities like Mosul post-liberation. Mm -hmm. Is there a question there? Yeah. More of a comment. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Uh, we talked a lot today about male terrorists who are getting recruited, but I was wondering if you could speak a little more about how the Islamic State is recruiting female terrorists both in Europe and in the United States. Yeah. And for those who actually go, what is yeah. life actually like? So for the women, for the men, it's kind of easy to see what is appealing. You know, it's the bang bang, it's the chance to be sort of this, this action figure in your own video game if, if you buy, you know, the, the spiel that this is, this is a true Islamic state. For the women, the ones that I have spoken to, it seems to almost always be a love story. They go online and they, and the, these recruiters that are inside ISIS are so good at showing attention. <laughs> um, the, the, the young woman that, that was in, in, in Washington State, she was speaking to a recruiter who was in England. The guy was on, on, her, on, on her timeline, speaking directly to her for six to eight hours a day. It was nonstop, nonstop, you know, and she, when, when she tried to pull out, it was, it was kind of like the most awful breakup you can have, you know, that, that moment of emptiness, <laughs> you know, where suddenly you're not getting text messages and you're not getting Facebook alerts and, and, and whatever from this person. Um, what they're promising them is that they're going to be the mothers of the caliphate. Obviously, from my perspective, it's just, it's incomprehensible why you would, why would you want to go there? And I spent so much time with this young woman trying to understand, you know, her motivation. I kept saying to her, Al her name was Alex, Alex, like, you do realize once you go there, you're going to have to wear a full veil, you know, the, the only thing that, that will be seen is your eyes. Um, and you're basically going to be under house arrest because unless your husband is with you, you can't go outside of the house. But I suddenly realized this place where she is essentially shielded from male, the male gaze completely, right, is in some way, sounds good to her. It sounds protective. Um, of course, it's completely messed up, and she luckily was able to come out of it. Um, but those are some of the dynamics I've seen. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk tonight. Thank uh, you. I just had a quick uh, question about uh, not necessarily ISIS itself, but in terms of terror in general. Mm -hmm. Do you think that with the emergence of ISIS over the past five to ten years, that has inspired other terrorist groups to form uh, with maybe different missions other than establishing an Islamic caliphate, but that carry out the same sort of terror and is still the same sort of fear that ISIS has brought out. Do you think that uh, basically does ISIS inspire other terrorist groups kind of thing to form? It seems like it's more inspired terror groups to, to fold under it and join it. Boko Haram was to me one of the biggest surprises. You know, this is the largest, one of the largest terror groups in the world um, and that holds territory in Nigeria and yet they chose to pledge Bayat to pledge allegiance to, to ISIS. 
so as far as ISIS, I see them as kind of the big dog <laughs> um, that is getting the allegiance of others. Thank you very much for your talk. Sure. Um, you mentioned a few answers ago the importance of denying ISIS the territory that they hold. However, the alternative concern is that military involvement from the West is yeah. so much of what has created this radicalization. So how do you reconcile those two viewpoints in looking at future US and Western policy in the region? Well, the Obama doctrine in, in Iraq and Syria has been to essentially help indigenous forces uh, that, are, that are pushing back. Um, and that's what's happening right now. So right now, there are some US military advisors uh, in Iraq and Syria. Um, and we're giving air cover uh, to the Kurdish troops, the Iraqi army, uh, and others that are that are partaking in this in this advance. So that should, in some way, um, inoculate us uh, from from the misadventures that happened in Iraq before. The problem is it's very very slow. So for two years now, we've been trying to stand up the Iraqi army to go after Mosul for two years. For two years, this. this dangerous terror group has had a haven uh, in both Raqqa and Mosul, has been able to recruit, has been able to create the system of remote controlled attacks with handlers. And so at a certain point, you ask yourself, you know, wh what is being lost in that, in, in that calculus? Uh, over here. Yes, sir. Uh, we appreciate very much your sharing your thoughts and experiences with us, and Thank welcome you. back to California. Thank you. Um, you're based in Washington, D.C., is that right? Or Sorry? Are you based in Washington, D.C.? Uh, I'm based in New York. Oh, in New York, okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned that the French intelligence was your, your main source in the uh, intelligence community, and I wonder why that is as opposed to, say, uh, American uh, intelligence. Uh, <laughs> is it a case that they are more willing to speak to you and share information than with the uh, than the Americans. Is their information better than the Americans, or is it kind of a logistical thing within your company that there are other people who are supposed to talk with the American intelligence side, and so you have to develop sources elsewhere? The the way the French system works, um, so when there's a terror attack, uh, th these suspects are going to be either killed or picked up, right? If they're picked up, they're immediately given a lawyer, right? And the lawyer, by law, is allowed to have all of the intelligence briefs, et cetera, uh, that, that emanate from the investigation because that investigation is, is implicating their client, right? So what's happened in France is you've had these, these numerous, numerous uh, attempted terror attacks and successful um, acts of terror. And so there's all of these suspects, all of whom have lawyers, um, and all of whom have these dossiers of documents. So uh, without revealing who my sources are, my point is that the copies of these documents are much more in circulation than they are in America. <laughs> um, in America, you know, there's, I don't know where to go for the San Bernardino stuff except for the FBI, and, and I've tried, and, and it's just stonewalling. You know, they're not, they're not revealing who, what contacts they found on on the San Bernardino attacker's phones, who the terror attacker, who the terror contact was that they were talking to overseas. Um, some of my colleagues have had, have had better luck uh, with the intel services here. But I have to say that um, my, my introduction to this beat was covering Mali. Uh, Mali fell to Al Qaeda, uh, the northern half of it, in, um, in 2013. And uh, sorry, in 2012. And in 2013, it, they were pushed back by the French, and I was able to get there pretty quickly. And I found thousands of pages of documents that this Al Qaeda affiliate had left behind. And I worked on those documents for about a year. Um, and I was shocked to see that what was in those documents completely contradicted what the US government had told me about Al Qaeda. At that point in time, we were being told by Washington that Al Qaeda was on the run, uh, that their affiliates had no, had no connection uh, to the core, and I was seeing exactly the opposite in those documents. So from that point on, I've had some um, skepticism about our intelligence. Um, it seems that our intelligence is more politicized than in other countries. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the CENTCOM scandal uh, where, where intelligence regarding ISIS uh, was, a, was allegedly doctored to make ISIS look less threatening, um, less potent. Um, so I carry that skepticism with me um, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if maybe that shows in my discussions with sources. This will be our last question. 
Hello. Uh, thank you again. Thank so you. I have a question, um, sort of about, more of a curious question about the nature of the different sources that you're pulling information from. And so it sounds like you have a lot of sort of traditional sources um, domestically and in Europe, but also you're relying a lot on Twitter and social media and Telegram um, to pull things sort of independently. Yeah. And I was wondering um, how, how effective are the, sort of the, the more modern social media sources? Uh, are those all, do you sift through those all on your own or do you have bots or do you, do you automate that process? And is that, are those reliable as compared to your traditional sources? Uh, yeah, I, th I mean, my, my work relies heavily on, um, on consuming ISIS's and Al Qaeda's uh, propaganda. Their propaganda now is in Telegram channels, um, predominantly. It's also on Twitter and in other platforms, but predominantly in Telegram. Do you guys have Telegram on your phone? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, anybody that is in this field has Telegram. It's, it's uh, a, an app on your iPhone or your Samsung that allows you to have an encrypted chat uh, with somebody else, and it allows you to create a, a so-called channel, which is basically a place where you're um, posting things and people subscribe to it and are able to read it, but they're not able to comment, right? So ISIS has these closed channels where you have to, essentially you have to have somebody on the inside give you the URL, because it's a very long string of characters. You can't search for it, right? So I'm, I am one of, I think, a limited number of reporters that are on these channels, and I'm surprised at how so many people in this field um, are covering this issue without being on these channels which, without, without essentially listening to what the group has to say about itself. It's sort of like covering Donald Trump without looking at his Twitter feed, <laughs> right? I don't think that's possible. <laughs> um, and anyway, so, so that, that has been an avenue where, for example, immediately after those attacks in Germany, I was able to have the videos of, um, of those attackers pledging allegiance, right? And I saw that they were being posted on something called Amok, which is essentially uh, a newswire for, for ISIS. And a mock is very much a black box. You can't get into a mock unless you're truly ISIS. So I knew that when those videos were being posted on a mock, that those guys had some connection to ISIS. I didn't know what then, but some connection to ISIS. Um, as far as my other sources, I, I work heavily on documents. I think that th there's something that happens in the process of you know, putting things on paper that somehow makes it more reliable. Um, I, of course, interview people a lot um, as well, but, but when, when you're forced to actually give an interrogation statement, um, that's somewhat different you know, than just talking to somebody in the street. So I do everything possible to get documents, whatever, whatever document is associated with whatever case. And then the last, the last I, I think, avenue for me is trying to speak to members of the terror group themselves. And now that seems to be happening in jail. <laughs> I saw them in a jail in Syria. Um, I saw Harry Sarfo in Germany. I'm trying to see various jihadists here in America. Um, and that's you know, yet another avenue. Please join me in thanking Rukmini Thank you. Thank you.